It's uh, my pleasure to uh, welcome uh, Mark uh, Weber. Weber? How do you pronounce it? Weber. Weber. With, Weber. Yeah, not okay. Weber, a uh, good German pronunciation. Uh, from uh, OU and NOAA in uh, Oklahoma, uh, from the uh, National Severe uh, Storms Lab. Um, uh, Mark is a senior research scientist uh, in Oklahoma and has a uh, big focus on research, has been always development of radar technology and applications in air traffic control and weather observations. Um, he got his uh, bachelor in physics at uh, Washington University and a uh, PhD in geophysics at, the, at Rice University. Um, after uh, that, I think you actually had a couple of uh, years at Columbia, if I remember that. I didn't put this down here. Um, but uh, from there, he moved to a Naval Research Center uh, where he worked for three years, 1981 to 84. And then in 1984, he joined the MIT uh, Lincoln Lab, where he worked on radar development and forecast algorithms to improve decision support in air traffic control. Uh, four years ago, uh, he then moved to Oklahoma, to OU and NOAA, where he works on technology risk reduction, acquisition strategy development, and advanced concept exploration for NOAA's multifunction phased array radar uh, program. Jesus, I can't even pronounce this term. <laughs> And I also believe that you uh, work a bit with UASS uh, in Oklahoma. So um, there's certainly a very strong uh, program there. So uh, please, let's welcome uh, Mark. Title of his talk today, NOAA Spectrum Efficient National Surveillance Radar Research Program. Mark, please. OK, <laughs> my mic, I think, is on. Yeah, I can hear it. So yeah, I'm going to go over a body of work uh, we're doing um, dealing with a pending acquisition program, uh, which, which I'll describe. And I just want to call out my um, uh, team here. We, of course, have uh, you know my organization, NSSL, and the Cooperative Institute of uh, Mesoscale Meteorological Studies, which is a partner to NSSL. And then OU, School of Meteorology and Advanced Radar Research Center, are involved, uh, as is uh, Lincoln Laboratory. And so I'll begin with some background. Uh, so some of the old timers here, uh, Jeff, I think, and Vivek remember the uh, terminal area surveillance system uh, research that FAA did back in the early 90s. Uh, this had a lot of different aspects to it, but it was uh, you know, looking at phase array technology and looking at phase array as a means for um, <coughs> detecting wind shear at airports, uh, circulations associated with uh, aircraft wake vortices, et cetera. Uh, Lockheed Martin was heavily involved, and uh, they kind of picked up on that with various experiments involving their um, SPY-1 system, the uh, phase array radar that's on the Aegis, or used to be on the Aegis uh, uh, destroyers. And uh, so there were a number of experiments down at Lockheed's facility in Morristown, and uh, actually a, a sea experiment. NRL was involved, John McCarthy uh, was involved, Wes Wilson uh, from NCAR was involved, so some connections there. Uh, and in 2003, the Office of Naval Research uh, agreed to loan uh, a SPY-1 system to NSSL, where we set it up, as you can see in the picture there, on a uh, pedestal with a radome over it, and used it for well over a decade uh, to do phenomenological studies with uh, rapidly uh, updating radar scanning and demonstrate possible warning benefits to uh, forecasters and really get the National Weather Service uh, on board uh, with this activity. So in the rest of my talk, I'll, I'll be focusing on the more recent activities in the context of uh, <clears throat> multi-function phase array radar uh, research uh, program involving FAA and NOAA, and then, uh, as I said, a pending acquisition program uh, that we're calling Sensor. So here's an uh, overview of this uh, IMPAR concept. Uh, Today we have sort of four species of operational radars, uh, aircraft surveillance uh, radars at airports, the uh, FAA's terminal Doppler weather radar, uh, the lo so-called long-range radars, the uh, L-band radars that provide national uh, aircraft uh, surveillance, and then the weather services uh, WSR-88D. And so they all have separate um, maintenance and uh, engineering support. Uh, most of it here in Oklahoma, not here, where I live in Oklahoma City. Uh, so, you know, a lot of uh, 
expenditure and effort goes into maintaining these radars. So the IMPAR concept basically involved consolidating those functions uh, using large fixed phased array systems uh, for phased arrays, uh, and that would, uh, you know, single architecture would reduce the uh, engineering support cost, uh, and also, as you'll see in some of my remarks, uh, improve performance, uh, really not just for us weather people, but for um, other applications as well. So we had uh, pretty specific, uh, you know, concepts for, for MPAR. You know, for example, this shows the notion of uh, consolidating uh, the existing network of over 600 radars, uh, those different types, down to uh, just over 400 by eliminating, um, you know, duplicative airspace coverage. Um, we also had specific <laughs> notions for the size and, and, and capabilities of uh, the apertures. Uh, and in fact, as you'll see, we had some technology development underway to show that uh, potentially one could build uh, active electronically scanned arrays at a cost point that uh, poor agencies like FAA and NOAA uh, could afford. And one aspect of the concept involved spectrum consolidation. So the notion was that the um, uh, air route surveillance radars operating in the 1.2 to, uh, 1 .2 to 1 1.4 gigahertz band uh, would move up into the 2.7 to 3 gigahertz bands where FAA terminal radars and the 88D currently operate. And then likewise, the uh, C-band terminal Doppler where the radar would move down. So we would free up uh, spectrum at L and uh, S-band. And oh, okay. And, and Jeff asked, uh, you know, well, d does that uh, spectrum consolidation technically feasible? And so I pulled up this one chart from my colleague John Cho, who's at uh, Lincoln Laboratory, and he did this work for the FAA several years back. So I won't uh, brief; it's a separate briefing, but uh, this sort of summarizes the analysis um, analysis methodology. So you start with that network uh, layout that I just described, as well as information on other uh, radars in the. Uh, uh, S-band of interest. Uh, that gives you basically a list of all the uh, possible uh, frequency channels you have to uh, avoid interference on. Then there's a propagation model, uh, an interference model, uh, and that allows you to come up with a table uh, for each of, you know, radar pair of the minimum frequency separations that would be required. Uh, because these were, you know, the concept involved multi-faced radars, potentially operating at different frequencies so as not to have face-to-face -face interference. We also considered uh, interference between faces on the same radar. So anyway, there is this uh, integer programming technique then that was used to optimize the uh, frequency uh, assignments for each pair so as to minimize uh, the spectral usage. And that gave you the total span of the spectrum that would be required for the uh, Envision network. So the answer is a little bit sensitive, but I'll say that to first order, it, it did seem that the uh, radars could be uh, compressed into that uh, 2.7 to 3.0 gigahertz band, uh, as long as you were careful in how much uh, frequency was allocated to each uh, individual radar. So uh, the concept uh, of spectrum consolidation seems, uh, seems valid. And so uh, that brings us to Spencer. Uh, this is based on a congressional act which was passed in uh, 2015, the Spectrum Pipeline Act, which allows for the use of funds from previous spectrum auctions to um, do uh, you know, research and, and, and preparation for future spectrum sales. So based on that act, uh, FAA, NOAA, DOD, and DHS uh, proposed uh, a feasibility or phase one study, and that was approved uh, back uh, about a year and a um, quarter ago. Uh, the concept is what I've just described and involved uh, removing uh, the L-band radars from uh, the 1.3 to 1.35 gigahertz band uh, and using the funds from the resulting auction sale to pay for the uh, engineering and relocation costs uh, associated with that. So it's certainly consistent with this MPAR concept that we developed uh, over the years, but uh, it's certainly other approaches, you know, it's just systems of systems, different types of radars uh, operating, uh, you know, maybe a single mission uh, configuration could also, uh, could also be used. Uh, 
So the, the rub here is that the act requires the auction occur by 2024. And that leads to this timeline. Uh, as I said, right now we're in the uh, so-called feasibility study. <clears throat> NOAA was the only agency to put in uh, substantial funds for R&D for the work I'll be describing today. The other agencies are looking more at engineering studies and sort of pre-acquisition activities. Uh, it also involves uh, this phase, you know, for informal interactions with industry through meetings and uh, requests for information, uh, et cetera. So in 2019, uh, I guess at the end of 2019, sort of the heavy lifting shifts to industry, and they have two years to uh, look at the requirements, uh, which uh, the government will release uh, prior to 2019. and. Uh, decide if they have a uh, relatively high technology readiness level uh, capability to meet those requirements. Uh, there may be some prototype demonstrations involved as well. And then the final uh, contract award to one or more industry partners to build this new national radar network is slated to take place at the end of 2021, uh, leading up to the Spectrum auction in 2024. So 2024 seems like a long time away, but for any of you who have been involved in uh, large-scale uh, radar acquisition programs, uh, this is kind of a scarily compressed uh, time cycle. You know, particularly uh, in that the government is not really giving uh, hard engineering requirements to industry, rather they're just uh, you know, telling them what we need to see, where we need to see it, uh, how frequently we need to see it, and then leaving it up to industry to come up with the architecture to meet those uh, those very functional requirements. So we could end up with some combination of dish radars, as we have today, of uh, spinning uh, uh, phase array radars, uh, you know, or fixed cylindrical or four-phase planar arrays. Any of those, I think, are on the table. As I mentioned, the network could be single or multi-mission, although if it's multi-mission, that certainly drives you to phased array architecture. If it is phased array, then the level of digitization is uh, up for grabs. It could be a corporate beamformer, subarrays, as uh, the system I'll be describing later employs, or a system where every uh, transmit receive module's output is digitized, allowing you to form uh, beams in arbitrary pointing directions, at least on receive. And then finally, I think the cost of the array aperture is going to uh, be an important consideration. Uh, you know, right now, military grade active arrays. Uh, come in very small quantities. They're used by the DOD for very specialized purposes, and they tend to cost more than a million dollars uh, per square meter of aperture. Uh, here, we're talking about tens of thousands of square meters of aperture. So to make that affordable, you really need to get that uh, cost down. Uh, at Lincoln and other places, there's good work going on to reduce the cost uh, down to 100,000 meters per square meter or less. Uh, but the technology readiness level is not uh, yet uh, at a level that would be appropriate for large-scale acquisition. So an important uh, sort of artifact, as they call it, is a set of uh, performance requirements released uh, about a year ago covering the aircraft surveillance mission, the uh, weather missions for FAA, you know, for example, wind shear detection at airports, and then NOAA, as we call them, high-resolution uh, weather mission, basically the services the weather service provides through the WSR-88D network. Um, so NOAA's requirements uh, are based on the uh, capabilities of the 88D. They're not giving up anything, but they're also asking for faster and more flexible scanning that drives you towards a phased array radar architecture. So the funding we obtained is really to understand the extent to which uh, phased array radars can meet uh, these requirements as laid out by uh, the Weather Service. So I'll talk about that program then in uh, a little more detail. Um, broadly, the work's laid out in under sort of three broad research questions. The first has to do with what are the potential mission benefits associated with a uh, phase array radar type architecture. Uh, I'll talk about those. Uh, the second one is what are the uh, command and control techniques needed to achieve rapid efficient scanning and what are the data quality impacts of a phase array radar architecture and uh, use of those scanning techniques. And then the third major area involves uh, the very challenging problem of uh, providing high quality dual polarization observations with an array-based radar. 
So the work is broken up into, you know, normally about 10 different projects uh, being executed by the uh, folks I mentioned in my title chart and involves a combination of analysis, uh, simulation, and uh, a lot of hardware development work. So I'll begin with a discussion of the, uh, looking at uh, benefits associated with more efficient scanning. This is a um, sort of a frequently used volume coverage pattern uh, for the ADAD. It's 14 elevation tilts from zero to 20 degrees. The CPI links are uh, appropriate uh, for the amount of clutter suppression and uh, estimate stability uh, required. And as a result, the whole sequence takes close to four minutes uh, to perform. Uh, as I'll show you, there would be advantages to reducing that uh, by a factor of uh, four, perhaps. Uh, and there also is when there's elevation gaps at high elevation angles, there's a cone of silence within about 50 kilometers of the radar, and of course, line of sight problems at uh, low altitude if you move out beyond 100 kilometers or so in range. So I'll get to some of the methods that we're looking at to achieve uh, more efficient scanning, but first looking at the benefits, a lot of this is tied to a concept at uh, NSSL we call warrant forecast. And, and as opposed to forecasters looking for radar signatures in real time and issuing their warnings based on entirely on those, the, uh, <clears throat> this concept involves feeding uh, observations into very high resolution numerical models, uh, one kilometer convection resolving models is sort of the goal, and then providing uh, outputs, probabilistic outputs from uh, an ensemble of such models uh, to the forecaster to help in his or her uh, issuance of warning. So the storyboard here just shows a notional uh, scenario where a tornado warning is issued, uh, at least probabilistic warnings of a tornado are issued well, uh, well in advance of uh, actual occurrence. Um, so this is sort of uh, driving uh, state of the art, both uh, scientifically and computationally, and we're very interested in the potential benefits of um, potentially uh, more rapidly uh, updated radar data going into the models. So this chart is uh, from a work done some time ago by uh, Nusrat Youssef uh, at our laboratory. It's an observing system simulation experiment uh, looking at uh, how models assimilate radar data uh, as a function of uh, radar data update uh, rate. And the issue here is studies have shown it takes maybe 10 volume scans to really assimilate a storm well into a model with an 88D updating once every four or five minutes, then for rapidly evolving weather, that may be too slow. Uh, so as shown here, after a relatively short period of data assimilation, the uh, phase array radar data on the right much better rep rep reproduces the truth and both in terms of the reflectivity, it shows the two uh, high reflectivity cores over on the west flank of the storm as well as the stronger updrafts. And of course, as modelers know, a better uh, time zero assimilation leads to more accurate forecasts. So not too many uh, observational studies have been done uh, in this area. Um, so we're trying to use our sensor funds to really significantly increase uh, the number of such experiments. We're continuing some OSI based studies, but we're also using data from uh, both our phased array radar asset and KOUN, uh, NSSL-owned WSR-88D, which can scan in sector mode and thereby provide very rapid update data. Uh, so we'll be looking at the ability to make use of uh, microphysical information from dual pole observations. Uh, we've got a, Zhugang Wang is looking at uh, targeted observation methods instead of just uh, scanning the whole storm uh, systematically using the model output to determine which parts of the storm have the highest information content and focusing your scanning in those areas. And then finally, the last bullet here is we're trying to get uh, Jenny Sun uh, from NCAR on contract to look at uh, use of variational methods and focus on smaller scale storms you know, and look at aviation impacts, for example. So we've got sort of a diverse set of activities going on here that I think will provide some important uh, feedback in the benefit area. So faster scanning is uh, one benefit. The other is uh, potentially better coverage, particularly at low altitudes. This could happen either because the contractor proposes a denser network, something along the lines of the CASA concept uh, that uh, I think some of you are involved in, or if they maintain a network similar to what we have today, if the um, uh, 
FAA radars become more weather capable, for example, because we use an array-based technology that allows us to form pencil beams instead of the very broad elevation beams you have today, uh, we get better much better observations from those FAA radars. And as you can see on the right-hand chart, that would fill in uh, a lot of low-altitude airspace, particularly in the eastern half of the country. So a couple of my colleagues at Lincoln Lab are looking at how that improved coverage might enhance uh, warning capability. Um, they're doing this by taking archived uh, either tornado warnings or uh, radar data and, and uh, uh, rain gauge data, uh, analyzing that geospatially so they can analyze performance as a function of distance from the radars either by altitude and tease out uh, variation as a function of that. Variable. So on the left, you have uh, tornado warning probability, the uh, uh, ordinate uh, as a function of um, the fraction of the airspace covered by the particular radar involved between the, in the critical area from 0 to 20,000 feet above the surface. Uh, and so as you can see, as that fraction increases uh, towards the right, the warning probability goes up significantly. Uh, likewise, in the right-hand side, uh, the errors for QPE estimates vary as a function of distance, particularly for the higher rain rates. And uh, you know, it's no surprise you can see you get uh, much more accurate QPE when your radars are close to the volume of interest that is scanning at lower elevation angles. Uh, so this is an area I think there could be uh, some potential benefit. So I'll turn now. So those are the good, that's the plus side. The downside is we have to deal with the uh, potential uh, data quality uh, issues associated with a different radar architecture. Uh, you know, we know that with a phased array, the uh, antenna main beam uh, size and shape is going to vary with scanning angle. The uh, angle side lobes are likely to be higher. Right now with the 88D, we have far out angle side lobes of minus 100 dB or, or so two-way. Uh, we don't think we can get that with a phase array radar. They're likely to use uh, long uh, pulse compressed transmitted waveforms. That leads to range time side lobes, and that's uh, another source of potential uh, measurement uh, error. Uh, and then as I'll describe in more detail, we're uh, worried about difficulties in getting high quality dual polarization measurements with an array-based radar. So those are inherent. We're also dealing with signaling or processing degradations that could come about through um, rapid scanning techniques. And I'm going to give you an example of one of those in the next uh, few three or four charts. So to understand those better, uh, we put together a very high fidelity uh, simulation capability. It's being fed by uh, WSR88D uh, level two data, base data. Uh, as a lot of you know, NCEI archives those data from every radar in the country going back many years. So we have a huge database to work on. Uh, we uh, clean up that data, uh, subsample it to a pretty high resolution grid of scattering centers, and then <coughs> resample those scattering centers using the uh, assumed uh, antenna patterns, range side lobe patterns, sampling schemes associated with the uh, uh, phased array radar uh, under test, if you will. And, so that gives you their the signals <coughs> coherently recombined. You get a time series output, um, and then that can be reprocessed with your uh, assumed digital signal processing scheme to give uh, output level two data again. So by comparing the output to the input, you get a good measure of any degradation that uh, might have taken place uh, as a result of the different radar uh, architecture. So this can be used to support either requirements development uh, by you know, varying, say, the uh, antenna side lobe levels between what we have today and uh, lesser amounts. Or you can look at uh, specific uh, implementations and see how they would do. So I'll talk a little bit about uh, some uh, work to understand the impact of uh, rapid scanning techniques. I'll just focus on this one, which is a technique that will be available to us with the uh, demonstrator system I'll talk about later uh, in the uh, talk. So with a subarray based uh, radar, uh, phased array radar, you can form clusters of received beams. What you basically do is spoil the transmit beam. Uh, in this case, we're spoiling an azimuth and, uh, you know, by three or two, three, five beam widths. And then uh, digitally uh, sample the array to form simultaneous received beams uh, spanning uh, the transmit beam uh, width. 
And so by that way, you can speed up the scanning in this uh, cartoon by factor two, three, or, or five. Uh, the downside to this is now you're getting uh, sort of uniform illumination, at least across the uh, spoiled transmit pattern on transmit. And so the only uh, side lobe suppression you're getting is through the received side lobes. Uh, so realistically, that could mean your two-way side lobes are as high as uh, 20 dB, at least within this beam cluster. And that kind of crosstalk between the receiving beams is of concern for uh, data quality, particularly when you have high gradients and reflectivity. So we uh, proposed a uh, approach to uh, minimizing that uh, crosstalk. Uh, so coming up to the bottom, basically, uh, for any specified volume scan period that requires a, you know, a speed up factor, two, three, would be typically what would be required for the concepts of operation uh, we have. And that means, on average, you would need uh, to be uh, forming beam clusters of size two or three uh, you know, inherent uh, beams. So, so to uh, understand how to allocate, they don't, you, know, you don't have to just do that uniformly across <coughs> the angle interval of, of interest. Rather, uh, we would use a rapid update search scan to map out the distribution of reflectivity and angle. Uh, from that, we can compute the impact on each radial uh, for uh, any selected beam cluster, T3, 4, or 5 in size. And then based on that, allocate the clusters so as to minimize the bias uh, across the field of view. And so this would be done separately within each of the four quadrants uh, associated with a four-phase phase array. Then once you have that allocation, you, you measure all the weather variables. So here's an example of the algorithm uh, working uh, on a scene. Uh, this is reflectivity. The uh, y-axis is just range going from top to bottom. The x-axis is uh, azimuth from uh, north, uh, south, uh, back around the north. And so what we have here is a scene with a storm really right on top of the radar. So it's uh, spanning most of the azimuth domain. And then you've got a line storm coming in from the south and the west. And so the stripe across the middle just shows how this algorithm has allocated uh, the beam cluster sizes. And so for example, you can see in the relatively quiet region, uh, you know, between 90 and uh, you know, perhaps 130 degrees, it's allocating rather large beam clusters because there's not much potential for um, uh, you know, bias there. And in areas where you have uh, much more structure to the reflectivity image, well, then it's trying to uh, you know, balance the allocation uh, to keep uh, the clusters relatively small throughout. So then you, you have that. You can now pass it through that simulation infrastructure I've just described to see what the effect is on the output. Uh, the columns here are uh, for reflectivity, radio velocity, and, and differential uh, velocity, with the left-hand column being the input data, and then the middle and right-hand column being, respectively, what you would get with this approach if you chose uh, speed ups uh, on average of two uh, or three times. And it's hard to see a difference, to be honest. If you look at the, uh, this is actually the uh, Moore tornado and associated hook echo. If, if you look at the velocity imagery for a speed up of three, you can see some uh, smearing in azimuth associated with this very high reflectivity gradient. Uh, but it's yet to look hard to find them. So. If you look more globally, uh, these are just some uh, aggregate statistics across uh, you know, four volume scans, uh, four million uh, resolution cells. On the left is just the distribution of reflectivity bias um, for a speed up factor of three. Uh, it's a log scale, so <clears throat> the vast majority of cells exhibit uh, a change, a bias in reflectivity of less than one dB. Uh, and uh, very small numbers with, with large biases greater than 5 dB. On the right, you can see that that average bias, the um, percent of cells exhibiting significant ZDR bias is a function, as you expect, of the speed up factor. That is the average number of beam clusters you have to use. And so by the time you get out to uh, you know, what we'd probably be using, two or so uh, average beams per cluster, the um, percent of cells bias is less than 1%. So bottom line is techniques like this can be evaluated fairly comprehensively using the simulation infrastructure we're building up for this project. <clears throat>
Okay, I'll talk uh, last about dual polarization uh, issues. So the Weather Service uh, retrofitted the 88D network with dual polarization observation capability in 2013. Uh, as you all well know, that allows you to infer microphysical parameters, size, shape, uh, orientation of uh, hydrometeors, and this is critical for both the um, um, forecasters and for assimilation into models. Uh, so this is sort of a non-negotiable requirement for Weather Service, uh, dual pole observations, and the, uh, the rub is they have to be made, uh, as John can attest, with uh, you know, very high accuracy. The allowable <coughs> bias is in the differential reflectivity highlighted in this chart uh, is supposed to be within a few tenths of a dB. So that can be done with a DISHA radar, where basically everything is invariant to scanning angle. When you move to an array, then, um, oops. then things become a function of scanning angle. And that's the first order because your array pattern, f of azimuth and elevation, picks up the polarization character characteristics of the individual radiating elements. And these are broad and exhibit significant cross-polar radiation as you move off of broadside. So here I've calculated the uh, uh, patterns for the simplest uh, radiating elements you can think of, a dipole. In this case, I'm looking at a horizontally oriented dipole. So on the left, you can see that the copolar gain uh, varies somewhat uh, as a function of azimuth scanning angle just because the projected aperture is going down. Uh, more problematic is the generation of significant cross-pole as you move out of the principal azimuth and elevation uh, uh, planes. And if you were to not correct for that, the impact on uh, differential reflectivity measure would be very large for even relatively small scanning angles away from broadside. Uh, so in principle, one uh, clearly can correct for this by measuring the polar metric characteristics at each of uh, many thousands of pointing angles, uh, but it's uh, a lot of calibration and maintaining the necessary accuracy and the stability in time is a question that we're looking at hard. So here's sort of a recipe that I uh, borrowed from Igor Ivik, who uh, presented last week uh, at the IEEE radar conference as to how one goes about correcting for that uh, uh, inherent uh, bias. Uh, so the first step is to correct for the copolar uh, variation in the patterns using a modeled and or measured uh, copolar patterns. That's relatively easy to do because the copolar patterns are strong, they're easy to measure, they're easier to model. Dealing with the cross-polar bias is more difficult. Uh, Igor's uh, first line of attack is the use of pulse-to-pulse -pulse phase coding on one of the transmitted channels. So, for example, on the V channel, you might apply a minus one or a plus one to alternating pulses, uh, and that has two effects. It tends to cancel out some of the bias contributions in the signals uh, returned to the radar. It also separates the cross-polar returns in Doppler space because you're putting a code on the transmitted signal and it separates them by half the Nyquist interval. And so you can then filter out uh, some of the contributions of cross-pole. So that's a strong method uh, for um, scans relatively, you know, not too far from the principal planes. Um, but then as you move further away, even that begins to break down, and so there you need to apply an explicit correction for the co- and cross-polar patterns, as I'll show you on the next chart. And these you have to estimate either via modeling uh, and uh, near or far field uh, calibration techniques. So this just simplistically is the uh, correction matrix that would be applied at each pointing angle. Um, this can be done either in the complex IQ domain, or as suggested here, the second order, basically power measurements of the uh, co- and uh, cross-polar uh, received powers. So the convection matrix, the correction matrix is a four by four matrix whose elements are determined as a function of your measurements of transmit and receive co- and cross-polar uh, patterns. And so after a application of that, then you get a unbiased order, second order estimate of the variables you need to compute. Uh, ZDR and differential phase, et cetera, et cetera. So Igor did a, a simulation using 
pattern measurements from the uh, Lincoln uh, Large Radar I'll be talking about next uh, as sort of input, and then he assumed uh, certain errors in the uh, estimates of the cross-polar patterns and plugged those in and calculated here the bias in differential reflectivity and uh, the copolar uh, correlation coefficient uh, for uh, two different assumptions on the um, uh, hydrometeor characteristics. And so the color scale here is set up so as it goes between the acceptable bias limits laid out by National Weather Service. So plus or minus 0.2 dB, for example, in the case of differential reflectivity. So everywhere you see color, you're okay. Where you see white or black, well, then it's starting to break down. So this is just a simulation, but to me it's quite encouraging that with uh, uh, high quality calibration and appropriate processing techniques, we may be able to scan even with a planar array well outside the principal planes and get high quality polar metric data. So to flesh all that out, we've got a body of work underway at uh, the university and NSSL. We're looking at uh, antenna elements that uh, and the array geometries that may be more favorable in terms of uh, minimizing the amount of correction one has to do. Uh, we're looking at calibration techniques, near field range uh, processing, far field ranges, the use of uh, small UAS with uh, high quality probes on them so we can do far field measurements with a UAS well up above the surface. We don't have to worry about multipath and ground clutter. Uh, and then finally, we're trying to understand modeling uh, as a calibration tool, how well you can use these very complex computational electrodynamic model codes. And as I mentioned already, the waveform and processing techniques that can make the job easier. Uh, so this is sort of the number one technical challenge. Uh, the number one thing I think that would prevent National Weather Service from buying into a phased array radar solution at this point in time. And, uh, we certainly got uh, at least a couple of years of hard work ahead of us. So I'll finish off here with a uh, discussion of our sort of a new asset, which I think is going to help a lot in resolving uh, that challenge I've just laid out. This is the uh, fruit of probably 10 years of effort that uh, I helped start up back at Lincoln Lab uh, in association with our MPAR research back then. And as I said, what we were looking at was the capability to build active electronically scanned arrays at uh, very low cost, at least <laughs> relative to what <coughs> is currently being used by the DOD. So I won't go through it, but there is an evolution uh, of technology, uh, a growth in the size of the systems we were prototyping and measuring. Uh, so back uh, about uh, three years ago, uh, this 10 panel demonstrator, 640 element array was delivered to NSSL. It's not really big enough to do phenomenological studies of storms, but it's useful for engineering measurements, uh, in particular looking at the stool pole problem I've been uh, talking about. Uh, so next month, uh, in June, uh, Lincoln will be uh, moving this much larger array, so-called advanced technology demonstrator, out of the near field chamber where it's being uh, tested Right now, uh, disassemble it, pack it up, ship it to Norman, and it will be setting it up uh, over the course of the summer. Uh, so what you see on the right here are just uh, the <coughs> receive, co, and cross-pole patterns uh, for one steering angle. Uh, I'll, I'll show you more about that as we, as we speak here. And so this was actually done for both transmit and receive. So at each of many thousands of steering angles, we have these patterns uh, eight such patterns which will be used uh, as part of the information needed to do the corrections I talked to you about in the last chart. This gives you a little more about the antenna. It uh, would be 100 panels. Uh, each panel has 64 uh, transmitting and receiving elements, eight by eight. Uh, we, we shaved off the corners, so it's actually only 76. Um, it consists of 24 uh, subarrays. You can see three of those uh, over on the left. The blue, the green, and the red uh, are, are, are subarrays and their associated uh, phase centers. Uh, so there are uh, 24 of those subarrays. Each of them are uh, H and V, so 48 digital outputs from those yellow dots uh, are, are what comes out the back end of the radar. Uh, the subarrays are overlapped, uh, which helps you in, in digitally forming receive beams that aren't subject to what we call grading lobes, lobes that pop up as you scan. 
uh, away from, from broadside. Uh, so <clears throat> the idea, as I said in my earlier chart, is with this architecture, you can form simultaneous receive beams and thereby do your scanning more, uh, more efficiently. Uh, the average output power is 4.6 kilowatts, uh, which is uh, five times greater, actually, than the 88D. Uh, but then the antenna gain is a smaller antenna, so uh, the sensitivity actually works out to be a little less uh, than the 88D. The beam width is, uh, in both azimuth and elevation, is well under two degrees, so that should be more than adequate to do some very interesting uh, storm, uh, storm studies. So this is, to my knowledge, the first large-scale dual-pole, uh, you know, weather observation radar that uh, has been built. All right, this uh, talks about the pedestal. So it scans in azimuth 360 degrees. That uh, has two purposes: it's to scan the point towards the storms you're interested. Uh, it also uh, <coughs> facilitates calibration using a far-field tower. I'll talk about it in my next chart. So you can steer it away from broadside relative to the far field tower and then electronically store the steer the beam towards the far field tower and measure patterns uh, at different at different uh, aspect angles relative to the array. It also rotates in the uh, elevation uh, all the way over. That's so you can calibrate positive beam steering angles using again the calibration tower. And then the processing, the digital receivers, the up converters, the down converters, are sitting in uh, racks, which are actually mounted on the uh, pedestal yoke, so we don't have to have long uh, cables uh, running around. And so the data are, are, are processed and then digitally sent through a slip ring uh, on the elevation uh, drive pedestal down uh, to our computer system. We have a far-field tower uh, that we're setting up. It'll be about 500 meters uh, distance. Uh, it's dual polarization. It's a horn, so you can rotate it to get H or V. It can transmit in order to calibrate the receive uh, channels on the ATD, and it can receive uh, synchronized with the radar through that optical fiber, so it can calibrate the uh, transmit channel as well. Um, uh, in the far field, as I said, it's close enough, however, that the wavefront curvature across the array is substantial, uh, and so we'll have to correct for that in, in doing the beaming. But our um, scientists are putting a lot of uh, stock into the data from that far field tower in terms of uh, sort of fine tuning the calibration uh, parameters that have come out of the near field measurements. So I'll turn to the uh, near field testing. Uh, you know, it was sort of some basic health checking and uh, aligning the amplitude and phase of each of the 5,000 elements so you get good quality patterns and polar metric data. And then it was uh, the biggest part of the effort involved verifying key performance metrics, uh, which vary for a phase array, as I've already said, as a function of pointing angle. So we uh, asked Lincoln, and they've done it, or largely done it, to do this on a very fine sampling grid. So one degree in azimuth and elevation up to 10 degrees elevation and then sparser grids going above that. So the total number of beam points was over 3,000. So to do a beam point, again, you're, you're phasing the uh, amplitude and phase of the elements to point to the requested position, and then you're moving this near field probe back and forth across the array uh, in both H and V orientation. It's also a horn. Uh, so it's a fair amount of work to get one, get one of these points. So to get 3,000 of them took us close to a month of effort. So here's a payoff with a cute movie of just one of the uh, eight patterns. This is the, um, okay, you can see it. This is a transmit uh, copole pattern in horizontal, I think. And you're just seeing the movie showing each of the uh, uh, beam point angles as we scan up in elevation. The side lobe structure has to do with, in the cardinal plane, you'll see those kind of side lobe peaks. That has to do with uh, two things. One is it's not a circular array. It's got some odd uh, scallops around the perimeter. And then the subarray architecture, you're digitally sampling the signals before beam forming 
uh, spacing much greater than half the element spacing. So that introduces spurs in the patterns, which aren't totally suppressed by the subarray uh, inherent patterns. Uh, so there, I was waiting for it to speed up. Fewer beam points at higher elevation angles. So it speeds up. And this is a summary of the near field test uh, results. So almost across the board, we pretty much hit the goals in terms of radiated power, directivity, beam width, uh, side lobe levels, cross pole isolation. We were shooting for 35 dB and uh, achieved that uh, with excess in the case of the, uh, the transmit. So that's not enough to make high quality dual pole ops. As I said, we're going to have to go through that correction process I described, but it's a very good uh, starting point uh, for the measurements. So I'll just go, go programmatically back uh, the two charts to wrap up here uh, and talking back about sensors. So this is a, you know, a unique opportunity to modernize uh, our national surveillance radar network using non-appropriated funds. The value of the uh, 30 megahertz of spectrum that uh, the government's targeting to sell has been estimated at somewhere between 11 and 19 billion dollars. So there's plenty of money to work with. Uh, the timeline, as I said, is the challenge. This would potentially be the largest radar procurement in history. Uh, just replacing one for one the radars we have today would involve 16,000 square meters. The, the MPAR concept involved over 50,000 square meters of active electronically scanned aperture because of the four-faced uh, nature of the concept. And at that kind of scope, uh, you know, we think this could really result in a significant uh, drive on active electronically scale, scale array technology, reducing prices, uh, accommodating architectures that allow you to change over the life cycle of the, of the system. Right now, these types of radars are pretty well uh, hardwired. You can't change much over their 20-year life cycle. You know, we're moving more towards a COTS model here, so it would be good to uh, accommodate that. And DARPA has a nice program uh, looking at that. And then most importantly, it could pay off uh, for the stakeholder agencies. I've talked about some of the possible benefits for, uh, for the weather service. But the challenge is, that, is, the, is the timeline that, uh, you know, we're making progress. I think with the uh, fielding of the ATD, I think we'll know a lot in one year and a whole lot in two years as to whether the kind of challenges I've described are uh, tractable. But unfortunately, two years already puts us into the time period where industry is supposed to be pulling things off the shelf and selling them to the government. And so there's a, there's a mismatch between uh, the maturity of what we would like and the maturity of what industry has today. So my only hope is that somehow we'll figure out a way to time phase uh, the implementation in a way that allows us to uh, catch up in terms of the weather uh, you know, technology and, and, and capabilities. Uh, the Weather Service certainly isn't in a hurry to change out the 88Ds. They've just finished a large service life extension program, which uh, will keep those operating well into the 2030 timeframe. So from that viewpoint, uh, the strategy would be OK, but it may limit uh, some of the opportunities for spectrum consolidation, might put constraints on pre-planned product improvement associated with whatever architectures you have to hardwire in uh, in the near term. So bottom line, I don't know what the outlook is, but uh, it's a good opportunity, and we're going to work like heck to see if we can uh, you know, get some good, good benefit out of it for the Weather Service and the other agencies. So with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you. Any questions? I don't think you commented about sensitivity you're expecting. Uh, particularly wondering, you know, about being able to see bright scattering and insect scattering, the clear air stuff. Do you have any, what are your thoughts on how well this will do? Well, with, with respect to the um, <coughs> ATD, the prototype NSSL is deploying. I believe it'll be about 10 dB less sensitive than an 88D. 10 dB less? Yeah. Because of the, small, because of the smaller antenna gain. That's just the ATD. But the, but the long-term, you know, the, the, the long-term goal would be radars of the same aperture size as the 88D. And in fact, those would probably have more sensitivity. You'd have four times the radiated power, for example. And 
uh, much more intimidating. So, so as was the case with our SPY-1 testbed, there's certainly some sensitivity compromises uh, for advanced technology demonstrator. Other questions? Yeah, Mark, I was especially interested in your your antenna pattern movie that, that showed the various beam positions. In particular, it looked like the side lobe patterns never changed, which seems strange to me. Well, that was in UV space, which is sort of the... Oh, UV, okay. The invariant so, okay. space for a phased array radar. That might... I, guess I, that, I mean, I was struck by the same thing, but I think, might it, I think it, in I UV space that makes sense. Yeah, uh, good presentation. I have a question regarding the adaptive beam clusters you mentioned. Could tell me how it's going to be formed, how it would be used? Adaptive, how many clusters you got and how it's going to be used in operations? Well, again, the subarray architecture that I described we're using for the ATD allows you to, on the fly, determine amplitude and phase weights for the TR elements that can produce a spoiled transmit beam of whatever size you choose. And then on receive digitally, you can form any number of receive beams in parallel, spanning the angular interval of the transmit uh, beam. And so the, the notion behind that algorithm was based on this frequently updated map of the distribution of reflectivity at each pointing angle. You would dynamically determine what size of cluster is appropriate for that pointing angle form the transmit beam accordingly and process the parallel received beams so as to speed up the scanning. And as I tried to show, I think the impact on the quality of the data would be relatively minimal just because normally they're not real strong reflectivity gradients over just a couple of beam widths of angular extent. You didn't, in the beginning, they talked about the three agencies sharing these radars. And, and I think at the very beginning, one of the first papers you put out, they talked about actually having individual frequencies for each agency. So you'd have cubes that had three frequencies in them. And what's your thought about the multi-frequency? I, I didn't quite catch out of this how many frequencies you might no, use. No, I for... mean, we worry, we don't really, we worry about interference between adjacent faces. Right. If they're operating asynchronously. So one face could be transmitting and another face is listening and so you'd probably want to separate those in frequency to avoid interference, either coupling around the antenna or strong ground clutter at short right, range. Right. And so how, that, how that are the agencies going to share those the, share the, the agencies would be sharing each face, sharing the frequency associated with each of the four faces. So I, I that was a concept. Not not that we just assign a different frequency to each of the uh, different agencies. I, that was a, those patterns that Jeff was just talking about. I mean, I assume those were copolar patterns that you were simulating. The one I showed you was copolar, but again, we had those for cross-polar also. We measured cross-polar as well. Yeah, I showed you one example, um, just to, when the movie. But this is a this shows co and cross-polar okay. patterns for a specific steering angle. The cross-polar is about 20 dB down at the beam peak. Here which is consistent with what you'd expect for a right. steering angle well off of uh, well off of broadside. So your timeline showed a, um, a date for an auction. Now, is it, is it correct that uh, everything that's going on right now is to try to answer the question yes or no uh, on the auction? At a high level, yeah. So if the answer is no, then what? We'll just go on the way we are today. So there'll be no no uh, consolidation of spectrum. There'll be no big pot of gold. Uh, That's correct. You know, I mean, we have appropriated funds from the different agencies. Or is there a contingency that the auction uh, could be deferred? Uh, that that's, would be nice. I mean, unfortunately, it's a it's a it's a law right now. So the only one that could change the date would be so the law has Congress, a, and we will the law has a date for the auction. The law, got, law has a date for freeing up or or a contingent a contingency right. that is. As I understand it, the law directs the government to free up 
I think 30 mega, 50 megahertz of spectrum or something. And so, so there could be an auction and free up the spectrum with no solution uh, for <laughs> what you're going to do about it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there are different, there are different ways, many different ways this could play out. I mean, they could move those L band radars you know, to some other frequency completely away from S band, and we, we'd go on with, you know, just separate single mission sensors that may be occupying. I mean, I suppose we could use ADSB and just forget about the long range surveillance. Well, no, the DOD and DHS want to see people <laughs> who are in ADSB equipped. So, yeah. I know the politics of this are intense. Yeah, those are scary <laughs> questions, Bruce. <laughs> Um, I've got another technical question. You showed a couple of pictures of, uh, and maybe even in here, um, uh, side, ro side load blanking panels, mm -hmm. a couple of them on each face. What specifically would those do? And uh, well, that's for aircraft surveillance. If you have a, uh, you know, a 747, it can have a cross section of a 10 to the fourth dBSM, and so it can it can show up in many beams well removed from the main beam. So with those side low side low panels are um, quasi isotropic receiving uh, panels and so those you know would basically recognize that uh, the energy coming from a given angular position is side lobe related, not main. So they're, they're used to recognize the presence of side lobe contamination. Okay, so they're blanking that. maybe in software afterwards. They're not necessarily uh, side load nulling. Uh, no, no, there's nothing fancy all. like that. They're just oh, okay. used for okay. post processing to get rid of undesired detections. So as <clears throat> sorry. Uh, so this is as this is multifunction. How much does the weather side of this lose? Uh, maybe this is the wrong way of putting it. But just to be blunt, if 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 this was purely a weather radar, how much does it lose now that it's sharing functions with these other agencies. In terms of timeline, for example? Like, you know, dwell time or, or yeah. you know, how well the your your data quality is going to go down because it's yeah. got a it's got less time to focus on weather and it's worrying about yeah. looking for unfriendlies. Well so our assumption has always been that we would maintain the uh, CPI structure used by the eighty eight D so that we wouldn't lose ground clutter suppression capability, that the stability of our reflectivity, velocity, polarimetric estimates would be as it is today. And the way we would speed up the scanning would be using multiple receive beams or a four-faced radar, of course, just gives you four separate radars in a sense. So uh, the, the goal would be not to give up data quality for that reason. Um, there might be issues that I've talked about associated with side lobes and unique characters of phase array. But on the timeline question, so we wrote a paper and analyzed pretty carefully the timeline allocation about a year ago in uh, IEEE TGRS. And, and so you need to, for a four-faced array, roughly about 50% of the timeline would be available for weather functions and the other 50% would be required for aircraft surveillance. And so with a four-faced array, 50% uh, fractional usage, that means you need to speed up scanning relative to the 88D by a factor of two to realize a one minute scan update rate, a fourfold reduction in our current scan rate. And, and so that was the basis for that little uh, exercise I went through with the beam clusters using you know two beams uh, at a time on average to speed up the scanning. I really enjoyed your talk. Um, speaking of the beam clusters, I'm wondering, because it, you're clustering more beams when there's, it's decided that there's no weather out there. Right. But like Jim was saying, there might be clear air out there that, that somebody's interested in. So if you cluster, say, five beams, what would this, would what would, would there be an impact on the sensitivity? Yeah, of, you of lose that? a factor of five right. in sensitivity. Okay. But, does it, you know, in, in, for clear air operations, you're normally not in a hurry either. Right. So you would probably just use a single pencil beam and you would dwell a long time to get as much coherent integration gain as you can. So I mean, don't worry, Jim, in the long run, you're actually gonna have more, way more sensitivity than I you have <laughs> with an 88 beam. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, give Mark uh, one more uh, round of applause. Thank you.